Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, everybody from around the globe. Uh, greetings from uh, the most beautiful winter's uh, sunset here in the very small little town of Maun on the, on the base or southern edge of the Okavango Delta. Uh, my name is Kim Nixon. I am the Managing Director of Wilderness Safaris for Botswana. I'm joined this, this afternoon with Let's Kamohelo, and Let's is one of our private guides with a rich history of, of guiding, and he will be assisting um, in certain areas of the actual um, afternoon's presentation itself. In terms, of the, in terms of the questions, if you do have any questions, please do make a note of the questions. There is somebody that is online to assist with answering those questions. Should we not get to it during the course of the presentation towards the end, we will most certainly stay on and answer those questions for you. So please feel free to, to ask as many questions as you would like. I am going to be speaking primarily about Botswana, but since this is the first of the presentations that, that we're making, um, I thought it would be prudent for me to actually give you a little history of, of wilderness safaris, where we came from um, and where we've come to, and a little bit around the, the ethos of what makes up the DNA of what it is to be um, an employee in wilderness safaris and also a camp within our portfolio. So our vision has always been to conserve and restore Africa's wilderness and wildlife. And we do that by creating life-changing life journeys for our guests, for the communities that we closely engage with, for the governments and uh, the local economies, and also for, to the benefit of, of the areas that we are very fortunate enough to conserve. This entire vision started 38 years ago and has remained pretty much untouched over the course of the, of the past 38 years. The vehicle over here is known as a Land Rover Ford Control. I don't think there are any that, uh, that are still operating, save for one in the small town of Maun. But we used to drive these vehicles from Johannesburg in South Africa up into Botswana. And the journey itself came across rough roads and it took two days because this vehicle travels no faster than 60 kilometers an hour or around about 37 miles an hour. When we started the business, these were the kind of guides that you had. It was a little bit rough around the edges. These are two of our founders, Colin Bell and Chris McIntyre. There are a couple of things about this um, fine tuned game viewing vehicle that you might notice. The first thing is that there are wonderful windows from which to view your wildlife and a nice sealed roof so that you, you stay nice and warm inside your vehicle. Over the years though, we, we certainly started to improve and evolve the offering and so the windows got larger as you can see, but the vehicles remained untouched. But if you look behind the photograph over here or in the foreground of the photograph, you can see exactly what it was that we were looking for. Pure wilderness, large tracts of, of untouched pristine wilderness areas. And it is this that we continue to seek in any of the countries within which we operate today. We used to operate camping safaris. They used to be what were known as participation camping safaris. And, and we used to ask our guests to put their tents up and to take the tents down. And we also used to ask them to, to assist with the cooking. This is what a typical dining room table would look like during, the, during that time. And this is in the mid 1980s. And uh, the vehicle in the background there is a backup vehicle that used to carry your tents. These were wild campsites and certainly wild times. Eventually, though, we decided that it was time to open a lodge. And working closely with the Botswana government, um, we competed for an open tender. And uh, it was in an area of Chiefs Island in Moremi Game Reserve, um, right in the north at a place called Mombo. And the image over here is the very first um, photograph, or very first camp that we actually operated. And uh, this is the first version of Mombo Camp. And Mombo, many of you would know, is our flagship property. And it looks like this from the air today. So we really have grown from being a very small mobile safari company with 
authentic, genuine roots with a clear, focused vision of sustainable conservation. And we've grown into being one of Africa's leading ecotourism operations, conserving in and around 3 million hectares of land. And if I can roughly translate that to you in how much space that means per guest, it is around about 3,500 rugby fields or soccer fields per guest. So we really do aspire to space, seclusion, exclusivity, and the most authentic high quality wilderness experience that is possible. We're very proud and privileged to be operating in a number of African countries. In total, there are 48 lodges, of which Botswana has more than 22 lodges itself. And we operate across Botswana, Namibia, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Rwanda, and also in Kenya. I'm going to show you a little video now which should whet the appetite with regards to what products we have, and then we're going to move into being more focused on talking about Botswana alone. There will be a slight delay and it will start momentarily. It's not just about Africa's most pristine and diverse wilderness and wildlife. or her warm and vibrant people. It's not just about rich landscapes, diverse cultures, natural wonders, or exciting wildlife encounters. It's about life-changing journeys with purpose. continue to make a positive impact. To Africa, its wildlife and people through visionary ecotourism. Together, we can continue to change lives, both now and into the future. So back into, into the presentation, I hope that that, in, that that gives you a very nice, brief introduction to, to whom we are. And, and these are just a few images of the lodges that we operate. We have a variety of different brands, both classic and premier brands. They're all extremely comfortable. They offer a, a varying degree of luxury. But what's key of all of these camps is that they are located in the most exclusive private concessions with the most unrivaled access to the finest wildlife viewing and scenery within the wilderness areas that you're actually visiting. This is an image Kim. from the library of the new Jar Camp. Sorry, Kim, one of the speaking. Speaking. Uh, just, just share your screen again, please. Yep. My apologies for the little technical glitch. This is the room at Jar Camp. And this is the room across at Bumbara Plains. One of the key matters that needs to be addressed right from the beginning is to, is to let you know that not one of our camps actually have got a fence around it. They, they are all open to the elements. And the reason we do that is because the guest is the visitor and wildlife are the residents. So wildlife very much can and does walk through the camps. It's very raw, it's very wild, and it's very free. And I think that's what makes the experience of Botswana so, so unique and authentic. 
when we build camps, we actually build camps in an extremely sustainable manner. And if you look behind the pride of lion walking down the road over here, in the background, you'll actually see a series of solar panels. <clears throat> this is just, just an example of, of one of a multitude of camps of ours that are entirely operated off solar, solar power. In all our camps, we've got solar geysers. In, uh, in all our camps, our effluent is treated to the highest environmental standards. And we're constantly measuring and improving um, and minimizing our impact on camps. When we build camps and when we rebuild camps after they have uh, come to the end of their life, and what you may notice, may have noticed in the earlier slides is that they are made of timber and canvas. And, and that's an indication of the light footprint that is necessary when one is working in the concession areas of Botswana. And one of the camps that we recently rebuilt was Mombo Camp. And I want to show you a video, um, just a short little clip of, of the process that we went through in rebuilding this camp and how we reused a lot of the old material that was from the old Mombo. It gives some of the heart of the old Mombo to the new Mombo, but also it saves from us um, in needing to utilize any more timber, which is sustainably sourced timber. So I'll, I'll, I'll show that video right away. Once again, there'll be a slight delay and I apologize for that. The concept of Mombo Refreshed is, uh, is, is the fact that we, we're very sensitive about making sure that we don't reinvent it. The design itself then was really important to us that it wasn't too much of a departure from the original. We've even been very sensitive that we maintain the original footprint of the room and we've recycled and reused certain materials and key features of the original design wherever possible and where sensible. to disturb or interfere with the ecosystem. We operate 99% on solar. That helps to conserve and protect the area, especially working in a fragile environment like the Delta. We went for double insulated walls to regulate the temperature inside the room. And with the blinds and the sliding doors, allows for more breeze and more sunlight to come in through the room. It's a nice name that we translate Mombo. We call it Marikampa. Marikampa meaning mother of all camps, and it is mother of all camps. Mombo has got a very diverse area. It provides for everything and a very magical place and being there you feel like you connect with the spirit of the people who used to live out there.
Well, as you can see, uh, we're extremely proud about many of our camps, and Mombo is just one example of all of the camps that we that we operate within Botswana and the group. And I hope it gives you an idea of how careful and caring we are when we actually build camps. Uh, when we built rebuilt Mombo, uh, not a single root on a tree that was larger than an inch in diameter was cut. We would build around that root so that we didn't disturb the trees overhead. And it's that level of care that, that we, we apply to the entire business. When we look at, at our business, we try to operate our business upon a principle known as the four C's. And the four C's in a nutshell really revolve around commerce, conservation, community, and culture, all under, underpinned by the fifth C, which is yourselves, the guest, the client. And were it not for the commerce, we would not be able to achieve what it is that we are able to achieve with conservation. The contributions that we make to communities and the upliftment that we give to the communities and the, and the work that we do to maintain and ensure that the culture of the people is part and parcel of the experience of our guests when they travel with us. I wanted to introduce you to, to our lessors. And I thought that it would be a really good time to, to talk to you about how, how involved the communities are in many of the conservation areas that, we, that we're working within. This photograph is taken from the Vumbara area and, and the Vumbara people from five villages known as the Okavango Community Trust are the actual leaseholders of the actual concession. Many, many months um, were spent more than 20 years ago speaking with the people about how we wish to develop the area for the benefit of the country and for the benefit of the community. And hundreds of staff and hundreds of people have been trained and employed and uplifted over the course of the last 20 years. Our commitment goes much deeper than just paying the communities a lease fee. It goes right down into how, how we might actually help communities become uplifted. And this is an example um, of last year in December, where we purchased state-of-the-art plows, took our tractors up to farming gandos or farming areas, which were communal, and we helped to plow a variety of fields for a period of around about five weeks so that we could assist the people to not only plow in the most um, state-of-the-art manner, but then also plant, fertilize, and irrigate the crops. And I'm very happy to tell you that after a good rainy season, there are bustling crops. It's just one indication of the level we will go to to work with our communities. So getting down into, into the meat of the discussion, I would like to hand over to Let's Kamochelo to give you a small introduction on Botswana, um, especially the size, the wildlife areas, and, and a little bit more information before I continue talking. Let's, over to you. Uh, good evening, good afternoon. Good morning, everyone around the world. Uh, this is Les Camarello in Botswana. Um, as one of the private guides for wilderness of Africa, it is my pleasure to give an insight information about Botswana, which is indeed one of the inspiring countries um, in the world. Um, we gained independence in 1966 from the British. And at the time, the country was uh, very, very poor very much reliant on uh, agriculture, but fortunately there was a discovery of diamonds, uh, which really improved uh, the economic status of the country. But today, as we speak, Botswana is considered as one of the middle income economy, um, that our GDP is about 5% per annum, and per capita, we are looking at about 8,000 US dollars. Uh, Botswana is uh, basically of um, the same size of the state of uh, Texas or France in size. And fortunately, as one of uh, the, as one of the um, countries that developed uh, the tourism sector pretty much late, late, we came up with a different concept of tourism, uh, which is a um, high volume, low impact uh, type of tourism. And uh, looking at uh, the, the country in terms of biodiversity, Botswana is a land of contrast. 
we talk about the world uh, famous wetlands in the north and the, the arid color desert in the center and southern part of the country. Okavango Delta is the main attraction in Botswana, as you know. And uh, we can't talk about the Delta without talking about the Lenyanti as well as Chobe National Park, which Lenyanti and Chobe are the two main um, elephants um, areas where they roam freely in this area. Um, there is also the Central Kalari Game Reserve, which is the second largest conservation area uh, in Africa. The first one obviously being the Saloon National Park in Tanzania. And the Central Kalari Game Reserve is about 50,000 square kilometers. And it's so open to the general public. And Wilderness Safari is a property in the Central Kalari Game Reserve, um, a camp called Kalari Plains. It's one of the unique places in terms of the habitat. It's not a true desert, it's a semi arid area uh, where the rainfall is estimated to be about 250 millimeters per annum. And one of the famous things about the Kalahari is this Deception Valley, which is the course of an Asian river that once flowed in the wetland times thousands of years ago. The river might have been tributary of a vast uh, ancient lake. Now it is a place of uh, waving grass where heads of springboks and uh, oryxes gather. And apart from that, it's known for you know, the predator species like lions, as well as uh, the cheetahs. Uh, Kim, you can move to the next slide. Thank you very much. Um, the, some other interesting facts about Botswana um, are the fact that there are um, very few people in the country over here. There's just over 2 million people, and they're mostly concentrated on the east and the south of the country. So the, the central and northern parts of the country are actually extremely um, wide and open. The, the boundaries that you see around the nature reserves and the game reserves, those, those lines marked in green on this map, are actually just lines. Um, they're not actually fences. And so the animals in this area can move over massive seasonal and migratory routes that have been laid down over the millennia. Just to, for those who have not been to Botswana before, the encircled area that I'll be talking to now is called the Okavango Delta. And in the very south, you'll see a small little town called Maun. Well, that's where Let's and myself are, are speaking to you from. And that is the primary access point in northern Botswana for guests that are arriving into the country. These guests that arrive in Maun will travel northward through the Okavango Delta or south first to the Makadikadi Pans or the Kalahari and then through the Delta and then up to the northeast of the country, which is where Chobi and the Lenyanti Private Reserve actually are. And then they'll generally exit and go to Victoria Falls, which is a mere 70 kilometers to the east of the small town that you can see on the very top of the map named Kasani. And so guests generally will arrive into Botswana either through the town of Maun or via Livingston or Victoria Falls in the north. And their itineraries will either go southward or northward. Yeah, Kim, uh, to add on that, um, seems like we might have lost. Yeah, Kim, uh, on the previous slide, what I wanted to add that the small population of Botswana has really helped the government to set aside at least. Um, 40% of the land for wildlife and conservation, which has pretty worked a lot because most of the challenges we face in most of um, the areas for Africa, conservation areas as uh, human and wildlife conflict. And that has really helped a lot with the reduction of that uh, kind of conflicts yeah, with humans. Thanks very much, Les. So if you look at this, this image over here, this is actually taken from space. And it is a photograph of the Okavango Delta. <clears throat> so 
when you look at the encircled portion over there, that is the portion that is within Botswana. And everything further to the top of the screen is actually in a small portion of Namibia, and then across into what is known as the Benguela Plateau of southeastern Angola. Uh, the Okavango Delta every year uh, receives around about 11 cubic kilometers of water. And in the US terms, that would be 2,900 billion US gallons of water inflow into the Okavango. And quite unbelievably, as Let's alluded to earlier on, being a semi-arid area, the vast majority, more than 90%, will actually be lost to the atmosphere through plant transpiration and then evaporation from the actual water itself. A very small percentage of the water flows out into what you can see on the southern end of the map called the Boteti River, and then a very small portion actually um, goes into the, into the ground, in, in, into the actual aquifers under the ground. In terms of size, the Okavango Delta, dependent on the time of the year that you choose to visit, is uh, in the watery areas between 6,000 square kilometers. And in the main of the annual water inundation period, it will exceed and expand beyond 15,000 square kilometers in extent. It is an amazing place. Um, it is, in my, in my view, um, the Garden of Eden. And I've spent nearly 20 years of my life here. In the delta, you find more than 1,300 different species of plants. There are more than 70 different species of fish, 33 species of amphibians, 64 species of reptiles, including, including the Nile crocodile, more than 445 species of, of birds, and over 122 mammals. It is a place of such incredible wilderness and, and experience that it was named the thousandth UNESCO World Heritage Site, and it remains one of the most well-conserved inland deltas on the planet, if not the best conserved of them all. So when you look at the Okavango Delta, it's really important as, as, a, as a customer to understand how does the delta actually function and what are the experiences that one can have if you do travel to the Okavango Delta. And this map over here is a very, very small little summary of what actually happens with regards to the water and the water flows. Our rainfall period is from November and through to the end of March into early April. And the same applies for the main catchment area where the water comes from, which is southeast Angola um, in the Benguela Plateau. The Benguela Plateau receives more than 1,200 millimeters of rain per annum, whereas the Okavango Delta averages in and around 350 to 400 millimeters of rain per annum. And so 15% of the water that is in the Okavango Delta usually comes in the, in the course of rainfall, and the vast majority actually comes from the Benguela Plateau. Now, this is around about 1,200 kilometers away if you're looking at the Kubango River, and it is around about 950 kilometers away if you're looking at the other main source river which feeds into the Okavango known as the Quito River. And both of these rivers take quite a long time to actually come down. So if you look at the map over here, the dark blue indicates where the water actually is, where the, where the deep water is. And as you, can, as you can see, if you look at the month of April, a lot more water is starting to arrive relative to what there was in January, February, and March. So it's quite ironic, um, and, and, and this is the trick to remember, that the Okavango Delta is actually at its driest when we're in the middle of our rainy season. And that's because most of the water that feeds the Delta comes from Angola. And so from April, the flood starts to arrive, or what we, what we call the annual inundation, and it gets, um, larger and larger through May, June, July, and August. And then from around about September, we start to peter down again and, and, and fade back down into the lower levels. And as you can see in October, November, and December, the Okavango's watery areas is shrinking. Now it's because of this annual inundation, this, this arrival of sediments um, every single year through this flood water, 
And when I talk about sediments, just in terms of chemicals and salts, around about 450,000 tons of that comes into the delta every single year with the inundation. And, and this, this um, mineral content and chemicals allow for rapid growth of vegetation. And it's because of this, this flooding and receding of the floodwaters that varied habitats are possible. And as a result of that, that diversity that I was speaking to you about in terms of the number of species is at its greatest. And that's because there are so many different habitat types for the animals to occupy. When you look at the Okavango Delta over here, I think the reason I put this slide in is to point out to you again in the south where Maun is. And then if you look at the top of the Okavango Delta, you can see a straight line that I've drawn over there. And then there's two fault lines on the other side in the south that I've drawn. And these are actually the remnants of the Great African Rift Valley that snaked its way into Botswana thousands upon thousands of years ago and create what is the Okavango Delta today. Previously, this was actually a massive lake known as Lake Makadikadi, which was in excess of 80,000 square kilometers. So in between those lines is what is known as a, a depression basin, and uh, it's called a Grabian Fault. And it's where two parallel faults um, leave a separated plate in the middle, which then sinks over a course of time. And as you can see from the map that I'm showing you here, in the panhandle area at the very north where the water comes in, the gradient is slightly higher than what it is in Mom. And it's for that reason that this, this cannot be viewed as a typical flood with a massive amount of water coming. This is a slow inundation of water that creeps through the channels in the Okavango Delta over hundreds of kilometers and a very, very long distance to get down to Mom. Looking at, at the Okavango Delta in a different way, I've inserted a map over here. There are, there are two very distinct experiences that one can have when you come to Botswana, and it's a very important choice as a customer if you're traveling to the country. You can travel through the national parks, which is labeled in the middle Moreni Game Reserve. It is a magnificent area, and it is a place where, where, um, where Mombo is located. On the outskirts of the, the national parks are all those numbers that are in there numbered NG18, NG22, NG25, uh, and 26. Those are all known as private concessions. And those white lines on the, uh, on the map over there are just literally lines in the sand with regards to boundaries between them. The animals move freely between the concessions and the national parks. The difference, though, comes down to how you would like to experience uh, the Okavango Delta. One can go into the private concessions, and there you have a greater degree of exclusivity, many, uh, much fewer uh, guests, but you have a lot greater freedom. You are able to go off-road for a premium sighting of lion or leopard if it walks behind a bush, or if you can follow wild dogs if they're hunting. You can, you can go on night drives if you like. You can go on nature walks, and, and then there are also um, shared activities that you can have with, um, with, within both the concessions and the national parks of game drives and boat cruises itself. One generally finds that the experiences in the private concessions by nature of the fact that, that the number of guests are so limited is at a higher cost relative to national parks. But it is in my view um, that, that those areas are where the finest experiences can be enjoyed in seclusion and exclusivity. So looking at the Okavango Delta visually, I think the first thing that you can see from this image is that there is a lot of water in some places. In fact, this photograph here, which was taken at an airstrip not far from ours, a place called Kanana, this is what the flood um, looks like at their airstrip as of three days ago. And one can see that access in these parts of the world is severely limited, and one definitely needs an aircraft to get around um, quickly, and effectively. As you can see from the aircraft in the previous picture, that all our aircraft are high wing aircraft, and as a result, the scenery as you're flying is magnificent. But the other point to point out is when you look at this kind of image, I challenge you to find the roads, except for those roads that, that travel from the airstrip. There are hardly any roads, 
And that's the beauty of Botswana. This is a really untouched, pristine environment. This is a camp of ours called Jakana Camp. And broadly speaking, um, and, and I apologize, I actually needed to point out to you something quite important on, on the previous slide. So I'm just going to go back there if you don't mind. Um, when you look at the Okavanga Delta beyond the experiences that I just explained, there are a range of experiences that one can choose. You can choose to go to a camp which focuses on the water experience and I'll take you through that experience shortly. Or you can go to the outskirts where it is where it is entitled land and it is brown. And these are the seasonally inundated areas, places that get their water for a short period of time during the year. And this is where the peak of the game viewing areas actually are. So what we recommend when we're speaking with our guests and with our customers is a combination of both the water camps and then also the, the actual land camp itself. That's the best way to get the, the, the true quintessential experience of the Okavango Delta. So looking at the water camps, Jakana Camp is a classic camp that I thought I'd just talk about. And we're just literally going to go through some of the imagery over here so that you can, you can understand what the water experience is about. As opposed to game driving, this is a, an area and these are places where you would actually spend more of your time going out on dugout canoes and also on the traditional um, uh, craft, which is known as a Makoro, and boats. When looking at an image like this, one of the key factors to keep in mind is that most of these little islands, the, the palm tree over there actually would have started as a, as a termite mound more than likely. And um, there are thousands of them through the Okavango Delta. There aren't that many um, different habitat types in these kind of areas. And there's quite a lot of reed and papyrus. And for that matter, it's, it doesn't really suit high density game viewing. But this is what is unique about the Okavango Delta in that it is an opportunity to concentrate on the smaller things. And I'll go through those, those images shortly. But many of you will have heard last year that Botswana had a terrible drought. So I spent quite a lot of time actually trying to work out how to, how to show and prove to everybody that, that the Okavango Delta is a natural system that, that has dry years and wet years. And so I, I, I dug up a whole lot of information um, that I could show you with regards to this. So in 2019, we really did have a terrible drought. But in 2020, our local rainfall was average to good. And then the rainfall up in Angola was actually exceptional. And if you look at the, the yellow on the map um, in the river area called Okavango, and you focus on the lion called Rundu, you'll see that the water level as at the 28th of April was at around about 7.15 meters at a place on the panhandle called Mohembo and or at a town called Rundu actually. And the normal level of water at this time of year is around about six meters. So what that tells you is that there is, there is a significant increase in the amount of water that is currently flowing into the Okavango Delta. But does that actually prove that, uh, that this is a good flood year again? And if you look at the red line on the map that I'm showing you now, that is the flood pattern of what has happened this year. And if you look at it as uh, against the other years that were inserted on the map over here, you can see that the, the flood this year is very much um, a good flood, um, a normal to above normal um, flood this year. And it has the typical two peaks that you would expect when you've got two major inflowing rivers, the Kubango and the Quito. And the reason why there's two peaks over there is because one river is, is, is flowing quickly over a rocky substrate, and the other river is actually slowing, uh, flowing a little bit more slowly because it flows through marshland to get to the Okavango Delta. So I thought to talk a little bit about, about the, the water discharge and, and as you can see um, in this slide over here, this, this is all the way up to, up to uh, 2019. And please remember the purple line getting up to the thousand cubic meters of water per second mark in around about May coming through at Mohembo. 
and then I'll show you the next slide which compares it again and you'll see that while the flood in the first part of up until the beginning of March um, tracked up quickly um, from March until where we are now we're almost at the green line and in fact yesterday the amount of water coming up coming through the panhandle at Mohembo was 814 cubic meters of water per second and that in the US terms is around about um, 2,400 cubic feet of water per second. And to put it into another perspective for you, that takes around about one second to fill an Olympic sized pool. One second. So it really is an extraordinary amount of water that's, that is actually on its way in. The two images that are on the left, the left and the right hand side of the screen over here, I put the, left, the image in on the left and this was on the 27th of April. I put the next image in on the right which is on the 28th of April and they're more or less the same areas just slightly separated by a few hundred meters. And the water is currently traveling at around about two kilometers to two and a half kilometers per day. So it really is um, moving quite swiftly into the Okavanga Delta filling all of those immense spectacular lagoons and, and breathing life back into the Okavango Delta. So the Okavango Delta, to sum it up, is a dynamic system. It's natural, it has dry cycles, as well as wet cycles. And the beauty of coming to a place like Botswana and the Okavango Delta is that you will see nature in its purest and rawest form. These are the traditional canoes or the dugouts that we are calling Makoros. And it's one of those quiet, gentle experiences through tranquil waterways, which allow you to focus on the smaller things. For us at Wilderness, it's not about only looking at the lions or the leopard or the, or the cheetah and the wild dogs. It's also about looking at the smaller matters. It's also about immersing yourself quietly in the magnificence and reverence um, that these areas each actually hold for themselves. And this is a typical image of what a Makoro would look like in any one of our concessions during the month from, from April all the way through to the end of September. Truly magnificent. While you're on your Makoros, you can run across these magnificent antelope called Lechwe, and you can see their long back legs, and that's because they're actually water-adapted animals, and they can spring and jump through the water, like this image shows you over here. But it is also a place where we can, we can chance upon nature walks and in nature walks you can come across this little critter which is known as a pangolin one of the most poached animals in the world today we have time to spend uh, enjoying the birds these are these are carmine bee eaters that migrate intra-african migrants that come through and, my, and, and breed in northern botswana during the summer months and photography is also pretty pretty special one of the myriad species of dragonflies that we have in Botswana. Many species of amphibians. There were more than 30 when I spoke earlier. And the other experience that's also quite lovely in these parts of the world is to go out and do a little bit of boat cruising and even catch and release fishing should you wish. Out on the boat cruises it allows you to get close and personal to the hippos without disturbing them obviously at a safe distance as well as to observe a variety of incredible birds over a, a larger a larger space or a larger um, area that you traverse through. And boating also allows us to head onto a variety of different islands for nature walks. This really is, in my view, the quintessential experience of the Okavango Delta. In the private concessions, we can do some special activities. And, and we always aim to surprise and delight our guests with special experiences such as this surprise sundown and setup in the water of the Okavango Delta on a nice sandbar with a couple of, with a, with a gin, gin and tonic in hand. So what I've spoken about now is the water experience, which primarily speaks about the dark blue areas that are on the map shown over here. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to move across to the brown areas, which are the land camp areas and seasonally inundated areas, which is where the game viewing starts to become a lot more dense and thick. And as you can see, this area extends around the northern part of the Okavango Delta, all the way around the south and into the west of the Okavango Delta. 
And all of these areas and concessions have arguably got wonderful wildlife viewing. The Vumbura area in NG22 in the north, um, above Chiefs Island in the middle of the map, where Mombo is, is one of the best combination camp areas in northern Botswana. And it's one of the rare camps that offers you all year round access to boating and Makoro, as well as the incredible wildlife experiences by game drive um, and night drives as well. So the first thing that you can see relative to the images that I showed you with regards to the water experience is how much more land there is available. You can see grassland, you can see islands, you can see riverine forests, and you can even see acacia sandfelt and possibly mapani in the background over there. And this is the key to these areas. Because of the diverse, diversity of, of um, vegetation and, and graze and browse that is available for the animals to take advantage of, there are a lot more what we would call niches or niches in each of the habitat types for animals to occupy. And it's because of this and the seasonal influx of nutrients that allow the vegetation to grow so well, you get incredible wildlife sightings. So if you look at this image over here, you can see fit, fat and flourishing zebras, but this rich mosaic of a habitat behind you, grassland, acacia scrubland, and then into the palm felt and riverine forest. One of the beautiful things about operating in private concessions is that it allows us to get up close and really personal um, with the wildlife due to the fact that in most of the concession areas we've been resident there for more than 20 years already all of the wildlife is actually very relaxed and accustomed to the vehicles and as long as we approach respectfully and from the right distance uh, and and observe um, without disturbing the animals they don't even care that we're there Generally, uh, an angry lion would have his ears back and, uh, and he certainly wouldn't be looking away in such a relaxed manner on a kill such as a giraffe like this if the vehicle was bothering him. The other beautiful part of coming to these areas is that the nature walks in these places are wonderful as well. You can head out with extremely knowledgeable guides and Let's, who's going to be speaking shortly, is one of those extremely knowledgeable guides. We're very particular about the quality of the experience and the guiding. And so we have an in-house training school uh, with guide training departments. And the entire idea behind that through a myriad of courses every single year is to make sure that the guiding standards of wilderness safaris guides are cutting edge to ensure that they not only know what you're, what you're, you're seeking from your experience, but actually are able to deliver it as well. And I thought it would be a good time for me to hand over to Let's now to talk a little bit more about his passion. Yeah, thank you, Tim. Um, I developed a, a great passion for photography during my early, early days of guiding, uh, which came from my artistic background, because before I became a guide, I was an art teacher. Um, through the guidance and the opportunity that I've been given by Wilderness Safari to explore my talent and my skills, which has in turn uh, played a very positive role with the guests that travel with us. And also I've gone to an extent of uh, inspiring other, other guides and uh, younger photographers um, to follow the same um, passion or those that had been willing to you know, learn about the subject matter, I've always been there to help them. I was very, very fortunate yet again uh, to do some international presentation, like in this picture here, in the slide I was in Cape Town as one of the presenter in one of the photographic uh, photo forum called uh, Wild Shot. And I've been there twice, um, which has also helped me a lot in learning so much from other photographers. And being a photographic guide is also very important because with that, I never felt I was very limited to what I can offer to the guests. Because pretty much every guest that comes on Safari will always bring a camera. Whether it's a DSLR camera or a smartphone, then there's a need to take photographs. 
Um, photography have taught me so many skills uh, and tips that I've been able to share with my guests, like the photograph here of African wild dogs working in synchrony, um, where you often look for the pattern. Pattern is very, very important when you photograph animals that are often in groups, um, because I find it very, very, sometimes it can be a little bit monotonous monotone as if you photograph, you know, individual animals within a group. African wild dogs are animals that are very energetic. And mostly, if you happen to be with them late in the afternoon, because the social interaction is very fascinating. Um, they'll be sleeping for most of the time of the day. And late in the afternoon, after it cools down, they will start to do some social greetings uh, where they walk to each other in a submissive uh, motion or posture, where they'll be playing with each other, um, as well as mouth touching, which in a way that can also be bad for them, looking at the fact that, that the endangered carnivore species uh, that are very sceptical to can and distemper rabies. And that is uh, spread by free exchange. Uh, if one has got the rabies, that can be passed to the rest of uh, the pet members. Um, our properties are great in the sense that, you know, they're so much isolated where there isn't much human activity happening around and on the outskirts of, our, of our, our, our properties. Because if wild dogs happen to be in contact with other predators like lions, they end up being in communal areas. And having to work in private concessions, like Kim have said, or having to operate in these uh, private properties, it gives an opportunity to get uh, too close and personal. But in this picture, I wasn't that too close. Um, I had to zoom to crop the image so that I, I could show up the details. This picture was taken in Vombra Plains, uh, which is one of our prime wildlife area in the Ogavango Delta, our premier camp. Um, I took this image last year, December. Though the Delta water has been pretty low, fortunately, Vumbra is in the more north um, western part of the Delta, where there is a bit of flow of the water. And uh, the rains have been so good locally. Though we rely on the floods from the um, Angola, but we still rely a lot in local rainfall. If there's good rain, uh, obviously the floods will be also good. Um, our guests have got the opportunity of spending more time with these animals, uh, looking at the fact that for a policy of um, minimizing our, our vehicles at sightings, you only allow a maximum of three vehicles at every sighting. Um, and give each other equal time to spend with the animal. The first guy we have picked the site is the one who is in charge, where we, we operate um, in that way as a way of uh, giving that exclusivity and also not putting a lot of pressure uh, on the animals. And when you position our vehicle, we position the vehicle in the sense that it doesn't interfere with the movement of the animal, we give them space. For example, if there's three vehicles that are sighting, won't be scattered all over, we won't pack the vehicle in a way that it will avoid the animal from moving in its um, initial direction. And this private reserve also helps a lot um, in terms of um, aerial photography. Like this image was captured in one of our properties uh, in Santa Juan area in Gomoti Camp, because scenic flight is one of um, another way of appreciating nature. And the best times that I find it fascinating to do the scenic flight is either in the early hours of the day and um, around mid-morning uh, till uh, late afternoon when the sun is almost 30 degrees uh, from the horizon. The light is great. More animals are out in the woods, into the open area, either grazing in this beautiful grass in the flat plains or even going down to drink. And often what you try to create is the long shadow, shadow on the animal, which gives a complete different uh, perspective on the imagery. And you try to be as much open as you can when you do um, aerial photography. And because you're too high, you try by all means to have the fastest uh, shutter speed uh, in order to make sure that your images are sharp because you are too far from your subject there is vibration of the helicopter as it moves, and the speed of the wind 
uh, between um, the photographer and the subject can be a factor uh, that can limit your image quality. So elephants uh, during this time of the year, during the summer months, they're often out because they're water dependent animals, they need to drink as much as they can. And also when you're on safari, you always have a reason to be up quite early in the morning and a reason to be late in the evening. Um, this picture was taken in Jakarta, where the camp is overlooking the beautiful flat plain. Um, I woke up my guests pretty early in the morning because you don't want to miss this opportunity. If whether it's a photographic opportunity or a scene to see or watch, because there's also a way in which we can capture these memories by seeing this and capturing and they'll go a long way in our memory when you reflect back to the places that we have been to that touched our lives. So I often uh, advise my guests that anytime on your own safari, have your camera handy in the sense that anything can show up or you might come across an animal or a bird that is eye-catching that you want to capture it on your camera. And I often say, Photos are never enough because the safari only takes at least an average of two weeks. But then it becomes a lifetime thing for you to sit there on the computer looking back on those memories, either by sorting your images or even editing them so that you can share those with your friends and families. Beautiful sightings like these it's all about anticipation. It could be about trekking as well as being at the right place at the right time. And um, if there's a kill, you know there is a likelihood of other predators showing up. Like hyenas are known to be scavengers, though they can uh, make their own kills. Wild dogs are the ones that are the most successful predators of them all, looking at at least about 80%. In some of our properties, you get to see hyenas running behind African wild dogs because they know that they are quite successful. And they'll do whatever it takes to intimidate the dogs uh, with the commotion that they'll make through the sound to chase away the dogs from their IKEA. A small piece of meat goes a long way. Whether it's a piece of bone or a rib, hyenas will always take it away from the wild dogs. Uh, wild dogs are one of those predators that, though known to be um, very weak, um, because of competition from lions, but they can stand against other predators like hyenas. No matter how big the group is, they can have that courage to face the hyenas and try and protect their kill. And I've came across sightings where dogs have been able, also on the other side, to protect their own kills from uh, other predators like uh, the spotted hyena, which you see spotted hyenas in most of our properties, uh, Mombo Camp. Umbra Plains, uh, Lenyanti Concession, uh, Chitabe, Goroque, those are the places that you will see uh, the African wild dogs. Hippos also are one of the most incredible animals, though known to be active at night when they go out of the water to graze. You often see them also uh, during the day. That was a beautiful picture taken uh, when the hippo was outside giving a jogger. Baboons, yet again, are one of those animals that I always like to stop to look at because of the fascinating behavior that they always display. Young ones, um, they never cease uh, to impress me. And not only that, um, predators like leopards will go for baboons. Alarm calls will often come from baboons. And we will take that seriously as guides a uh, trek because finding animals, it involves an element of trekking trying to initiate your senses, sense of sight, sense of hearing and smell. Smell, stop, and uh, pick the smell of the dead carcass and take it from there. Um, I find it quite, quite interesting from the, um, the interaction, social interactions of baboons, uh, the way um, they relate to each other within the group. And in a way, yet again, they help other animal species like impalas once they give that alarm call. And uh, impalas, they'll tend to be a close proximity with baboons because baboons have got a, 
a high advantage where they can see over the tall grass, where they can see up from the trees for upcoming predators and the other mother animal species. Thanks very much, Let's. So I thought I'd show you a few other interesting sightings before ending the presentation today, and I hope that you've really enjoyed your time with us. Leopard are one of those secretive animals that will only let you see it if it actually wants you to see it. Um, so you really do need to go out with expert guides like Let's who are able to track these animals down. But they really are one of the most incredible cats with the most incredibly diverse range of food items that they go for. And they eat, uh, at last, uh, when, I, when I last read up about it, more than 120 different prey items, everything from a dung beetle all the way up to a warthog or a kudu. And this is a perfect example of a leopard that has seen a drying a pond and spent its time actually learning how to hunt fish. And this is what happened. Um, there was a lot of learning, um, no fish in this, in this instance, but there are a lot of examples um, of, of these cats going to great length to learn new behavior. And in the end, these cats actually were able to, to hunt fish. This was in an area known as Savuti. These kind of images are possible when you're looking at, when you're moving in through these concessions. Because the mother is relaxed with the vehicle, you find that the cubs become very relaxed with the vehicles very, very quickly as well. And this little, this little guy over here, completely relaxed, allows guests to actually sit and stay and enjoy the sighting without necessarily rushing on from one to the next. In regards to lion, we do really do have quite a lot of lion. We're blessed with these predators. In each of the concessions, the beauty about the guides there is that they stay for a long period of time. They get to know the dynamics of the prides in the area. We know the generations. We understand what the makeup is, which female had how many cubs, what generation they are, what, who was their father, um, and who the pride males actually are in each of these concessions. But they're magnificent animals, and we are able to get really up close to them and enjoy their, their, their um, behaviors. All the way from a mother carrying her young cub and this is a very small little cub in her mouth, tenderly and gently, to a little bit more feisty of a little animal. And then it wouldn't be a presentation of Botswana if we didn't include one of these wily little creatures, the honey badger. And uh, you would have all seen the videos, honey badger don't care. We are very lucky to be quite blessed with good honey badger populations, especially in the Kalahari Desert that we, we are able to enjoy. Very feisty, gnarly animals, big teeth, lots of claws, generally quite angry, but a wonderful animal to spend time with and observe. But most of all, Botswana and the safari industry is about relaxing, enjoying your holiday, having an immersive wildlife experience with life-changing um, experiences in privacy, seclusion, and extraordinary comfort. This is a place called the, the Balianja Star Deck, and it is a place where you can be completely on your own with your own guide. There is a bento box meal that is set up for you. And for me, apart from the massively luxurious lodges that we have, this is the ultimate luxury, being alone in nature, in complete comfort, safety, surrounded by nature. And I hope very much that everybody has enjoyed the presentation tonight. And that when all of this has passed, we will see you and be able to welcome you back to Botswana, a place that is very, very far away from the lights. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon, this morning, and this evening. I wish you a wonderful day.